As Ray said, I work for 350.org, which is an international grassroots climate change campaigning organisation. Um, in the UK, primarily, we support the fossil fuel divestment network in all of its forms in every institution that it works in. So I'm going to start by telling you a bit about the history of divestment uh, and why we do it, and then I'll hand over to Rebs to talk about the success of the SOAS campaign and why we think that might have happened. So for those who don't know, uh, fossil fuel divestment is a campaign targeting public institutions and asking them to pull their investments out of fossil fuel companies. It's pretty simple. In short, the campaign demands that they dump their investments in shares in companies which fuel climate change and instead consider how their investments could be used for public good. Um, what started with a group of students at Swarthmore University in the United States has now grown to be the fastest growing divestment movement of all time. Uh, it spread rapidly from university campuses to faith institutions, health organisations, philanthropic foundations, cities, states and pension funds across the whole world. <coughs> there are now 1,300 campaigns globally uh, in every continent and in the UK alone there are campaigns at 70 universities, almost every major faith group and nearly 50 local councils. We're making some serious ground as well. Um, in September, it was announced that nearly 500 institutions globally, with an asset base of over $2.6 trillion, have committed to divest, which is pretty impressive. Um, just a year ago, that total was 180 institutions and $50 billion. So you can see that that trajectory is so sharp, it's really snowballing. Um, one of those commitments was none other than the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, who the Rockefellers were the forefathers of the fossil fuel industry in America. And what you see there is that very industry turning its back on fossil fuels um, after trying to change the industry for years and instead divesting, um, which is obviously the significance of that was lost on very few people. Um, within the last year alone, Syracuse University divested its $1.8 billion fund in America. This was followed days later by the Guardian Media Group divesting $800 million from fossil fuels and they became the largest um, divestment commitment so far. They were then basically blown out of the water a week later by the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund divesting $40 billion from the coal industry. Um, so as you can see, these <laughs> commitments are coming thick and fast and from all over the world. The movement has won endorsement from the UN, from the Governor of the Bank of England, um, and religious leaders like Desmond Tutu, who have called on institutions of conscience to break their ties from the fossil fuel industry. He said that it makes no sense to invest in something that undermines our future, which I think makes inherent sense when you think about it. Um, divestment's also forcing ripples in financial circles and quite unexpected places, which I'll come on to in a minute. Here in the UK, the movement's kind of going from strength to strength. In Europe, we've had many of the firsts, um, Health campaigners from Fossil Free Health pushed the British Medical Association to divest. A uh, hundred charitable foundations in the UK have divested. We've had the first universities, the first faith denominations, and our national media outlets coming on side. So the UK is really a leader globally on the divestment movement. In this last month, we've seen two councils commit to support divestment, Kirklees and Cambridge. The Environment Agency Pension Fund becoming the first public pension fund in the UK to move its money and the University of Surrey becoming the eighth university to divest its endowment. That's just in the last three weeks. So why has the divestment movement been so successful? Um, these are the reasons why I think it's been successful. Number one, divestment speaks to the power dynamics of the situation we're currently in. Using basic maths, we can't go over two degrees of warming, and that is equivalent to 565 gigatons of carbon that the fossil fuel industry can burn. They have five times more than that in their reserves already. So these pieces kind of fit together to make the fossil fuel industry public enemy number one and the main blocker of action on climate change. The divestment movement is about challenging the very power structures that have seen hundreds and hundreds of millions poured into lobbying politicians, propagating misinformation and searching for more fossil fuel reserves to continue the, this path that we really can't go down. Number two, Divestment is a simple concept, and most people that understand the threat of climate change get it intuitively. If you don't like something, don't support it, don't give it your money. 
to quote Bill McKibben, if it's wrong to wreck the planet, it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. Thirdly, the, de the divestment movement is decentralised and it's grassroots. Um, as I said before, there's over 1,300 campaigns across the world, started by people in their own homes, their workplaces, and that makes this movement really uncontainable. Anyone can pick up the narrative and run with it, and they are. There are no real leaders in the divestment movement. We can't know everyone that acts under the, move the banner of divestment, but we're only united by the common message and a common tactic, and that makes us powerful. Anyone can take part because everyone has a stake in a public institution of some kind. Number four, our divestment case is backed up with some powerful financial arguments. So while the moral case is irresistible to many people, and I'm sure many of you in this room will get that intuitively, there's also a growing body of work which shows that the finances of investing in fossil fuels just don't really add up in the long term. Um, Warnings of stranded assets that have been around for a few years now are becoming increasingly dominant in financial circles and it's really helping us strengthen our case. And finally, number five, divestment is building momentum and creating wins. Um, divestment alone won't create the change that we need and we all know that and acknowledge that. But what it is doing, which is something that I think the climate change movement desperately needs, is building hope. It gives us a chance to build our power and it gives us moments along the way we can see we're winning and we can celebrate together. While we'll never financially bankrupt the fossil fuel industry with this campaign, what we can do is successfully politically and socially bankrupt them, make them public enemy number one that they are and stop them physically obstructing the progress we need. I couldn't care less if some faceless city suit buys the shares that the Church of England or Edinburgh University or the British Medical Association have dropped. What I do care about is that our faith organisations, our health organisations, our universities, pension funds, local councils are drawing a line in the sand, are turning their back on the fossil fuel industry um, and are changing the way our society and politicians think about the fossil fuel industry and their transition from being benign energy providers to the pariah industry that they are putting their profits ahead of the global needs for a working planet. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rebs to talk about one of our most successful campaigns, which was the campaign at SOAS, um, who will address, I think, a bit more of the detail of the mechanisms of it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Rebecca. I have just finished doing a master's at SOAS, which is um, part of the University of London. Um, I'm now a political campaigner at Greenpeace um, and have spent the last couple of years um, doing quite a lot of grassroots campaigning in the divestment movement. Um, so I got involved with the divestment campaign at SOAS with a friend in response to a great sense of frustration and helplessness in relation to the issue of climate change. And I would say that very much relates to the uh, uh, sort of vision of, of a post-growth, degrowth economy. I feel like I totally agree with that in principle, but there's quite a big political and social challenge about how do we actually reach that goal in the context of a society that is, you know, quite frankly, completely wedded to the paradigm of growth. And we're seeing that in our poli the political narratives of all of our, our politicians and our leaders today. And divestment, for me and for my um, course mates at SOAS, offered a very real, practical, tangible way to actually address this issue because it does, as Ellen said, spe it speaks to the power of the fossil fuel industry. It's not about trying to directly um, undermine the financial strength of the fossil fuel industry. It's about breaking the social and political license of the industry, which is currently incredibly strong because of the links that exist between the industry and our politicians in terms of their big, there's a revolving door between the industry and made many people in power now and the lobbying that they do behind the scenes that ends up preventing really important policies to tackle climate change from coming into place. So divestment through getting big institutions like universities and um, local authorities to remove their investments and to make that public statement, we do not want to be associated with this industry anymore, fundamentally undermines the social and political standing of the industry and 
that is a bit important tactic because in the long run that helps to make a more conducive policy environment so that we can push forward with some of the sustainable policies that we really need. Um, so that's kind of the sort of um, why I wanted to get involved and why I think divestment is a really important strategy if we're talking about how to tackle climate change and how to promote a post-growth economy. Um, in terms of our actual campaign, um, we, it started off in November uh, 2013 um, with uh, a unanimous support, a uh, vote in, of support from the student union. So everyone, all the students agreed that it's completely wrong that the university should be profiting from an industry that fundamentally went against the values of the institution itself. Um, so as in particular focuses on development um, and quite a lot of issues relating to yeah, less developed countries and climate change. So it was fundamentally inconsistent for the university to be holding these shares. Um, and we, we took a very um, deliberately, a very constructive insider approach to trying to get this decision made within SOAS. We had lots of discussions with management to put forward the vision. And we were really surprised, actually. Um, we, were, we were very re ready to make the case to management that this was also in their financial interest to divest because um, the fossil fuel industry is um, increasingly um, more of an insecure investment in the long run. But the management came back to us and said, actually, we care about the moral case. That's the strongest argument. Please, can you focus on that when you have to convince other people within the university? Which we were quite shocked by, but very encouraged as well. Um, so we carried on doing that, and we had to scope things out with the, with the um, financial team in the university to make sure that this wasn't going to fundamentally jeopardize SOAS's financial position. And um, they went to their, invest their asset managers who came back and said, actually, in the medium to long term, the financial impact of divesting is going to be negligible. So that kind of gave us extra strength with the campaign. <coughs> and um, things carried on ticking along. And we got to the final stage of talking to the governing body. And they were very, very committed to having a very holistic approach to this. So um, they recognised that if they were going to divest, it would be very likely that people would look at the rest of the policies of the university and say, well, is this decision consistent with a lot of the other things that un the university is doing? In particular, donations policy and also other things that the university is doing on campus to try and reduce its um, carbon footprint. And so we worked with the management to make an adjustment to the donations policy as well, which basically now rules out taking any donations from the industry as well. And we also um, introduced some new policies to get the school to reduce its carbon footprint. And that, uh, was that those decisions were made alongside a final decision to divest uh, in June this year. Um, so as this portfolio in fossil fuels is, is relatively small, because it's a relatively small university, so it, it was about £1 million being divested over a period of three years. Um, and we're now moving on to um, considering reinvestment options um, and how those funds in the longer term can actually be put back into sustainable energy um, and actually sort of continue to represent the values that SOAS holds. Um, that's about it, really. Great. Thank you very much for both of you.